things that we call fun, they didn't pop up after the fall, but God created uh, the world and our capacity to enjoy him before the fall. God created fun with a purpose, and we still as Christians have the opportunity to enjoy fun consistent with that purpose. Fun was never intended to be ultimate or ultimately satisfying. If you go to the next slide, people can see the, uh, be reminded of the outline from last week. Fun was never intended to be ultimate or ultimately satisfying or to be the ultimate goal of our pursuits. Rather, our satisfaction and joy we learned would be, were to be found in God alone. Fun ultimately points us to the giver of fun. Well, that's a lot smaller than when, when I made it. Huh. All right. Well, that, that is not what the slides looked like when I uploaded, when I gave them to them. But so I apologize. Basically, the, I just summarized the outline from last week that fun was created by God and it was created with a purpose. And ultimately, it points us to the giver of fun. Having fun, we learned, is a, is a way to glorify God. And now the second point is what we're going to spend the first part of our time today on is that sin corrupted our relationship with fun. God's gifts don't tempt us to sin. It's our desires that do. And we, we learned, if you remember, it's the deceitful demon doctrine that would tell us, oh, the really spiritual, the really religious thing is don't touch, don't taste, don't enjoy the teaching of aesthetics. That places the evil, the, the object, the, the thing that, that we want to avoid on the gifts themselves, whether it's food that our flesh might tempt us to sin with, or sex and marriage that our flesh might tempt us to sin with, those things are not where sin lies. Sin lies in our heart. So the good things that God give, gave to be received with thanksgiving, the fun things, those are not sinful. It's the distortion of those things that comes from our heart. John Piper says in his very good book, Money, Sex, and Power, he says, money, sex, and power, or the good gifts and the capacity to enjoy them. I believe I have a slide of this. Looks like my PowerPoint's not, uh, not functioning well, so I'll just read it, pay attention. He says, money, sex, and power are, from the beginning, gifts of God good gifts of God. And if they, if those good gifts sink us, it isn't because God gave us bad gifts. It's because something happened inside of us to turn gifts of grace into instruments of sin. Let's consider the first sin. Uh, in prep for this, you can turn your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 3. Let's consider the first sin and how that's exactly what happened. It wasn't God's gifts. It wasn't that God gave bad gifts, but something happened to turn gifts of grace into instruments of sin. So the setting of Genesis chapter 3 is that God had created the world. And he created everything in it, and he declared that all of it was good. God created the world for his glory. He created Adam and Eve in his image. He put them in the garden. He set them over all the good things that he had created. And God put in Adam and Eve the capacity to enjoy all the good things the world has to offer. He put in them the capacity to have fun. Remember our definition of fun. 
I think we see part of it on the PowerPoint. I'm not, again, I apologize. Our definition of fun from last time was the enjoyment of or taking pleasure in the sensations, or experiences, sensations, people, or things in this life. Fun, if, if you think about this, this is what we call fun. It's the enjoyment of or taking pleasure in experiences, sensations, people, or things in this life. Just six days before the God made man, but six days before the end of creation, none of the things in this world existed. Now, there were people created in God's image who could take pleasure in experiences. Experiences like running, riding horses, sitting on a beach, watching a sunrise or a sunset, throwing things, sitting around a campfire, staring at stars, dancing, laughing, singing, climbing, solving puzzles, learning new skills, inventing, gardening, hiking, swimming, feeling the breeze, listening to its silence, listening to animal sounds like the trumpeting of elephants, climbing trees, smelling flowers, exploring caves, playing with animals, observing insects, watching clouds, running barefoot through the grass, exploring mountain paths, sitting under the shade of trees, building sand castles. You could go on and on and on. All of these things were not intended to distract us from God, but to be received from him with thanksgiving for the purpose for which he gave them, to be enjoyed as gifts. Think about it. Before creation, none of those things could happen. There was no man with the capacity to enjoy them, and none of the objects which God gave them to enjoy were there. Let's think of the sensations that God created. God didn't have to make us with the ability to feel these things. Sensation, warmth, so we could feel the sun. Coolness, so we could feel the breeze. Taste, so we could enjoy food, like the sweetness of fruit, the saltiness of salt, the spiciness of peppers, coffee, curry, coconut, caramel, chilies, cherries, and chocolate. <laughs> Think of smell. To enjoy the aroma of flowers, the scent of, freshly cooked, of a freshly cooked meal, or the smell of someone you love. Sounds so we can enjoy running water, another's voice, the roar of a lion, the laughing of a hyena, or the flitting of a hummingbird, a simple melody or a complex symphony. God put this in man, the capacity to enjoy. Feelings, feeling like feeling the softness of fur or the roughness of sand the sliminess of a frog or the smooth texture of a spouse's lips. Sight so we could know what beauty is. To enjoy the colors of a sunset or the fruit on a tree, flowers, animals, sea. Think of what your life would be like, the enjoyments that would be missing if God didn't give you sight and put in us the sensation of pleasure at seeing a beautiful thing. Consider the sensations that we enjoy that are a little less tangible, but God put in us that we get from the experiences we enjoy. Joy, peace, love, gratitude, wonder, amazement, awe, contentment, excitement, inspiration, empathy, curiosity, trust, elation, anticipation, wonderment, exhilaration, tiredness, and rest. These are not bad things. These are good things, good gifts from God that have been corrupted by sin, this side of the fall. All of these things and the ability to enjoy them are the setting before Genesis 3. He didn't just give experiences and sensations he gave Adam to Eve and Eve to Adam. He gave us people. 
And he intended that we make more people and enjoy this creation together, to have fun together, to laugh together, walk hand in hand, enjoy long conversations, sit together in silence, share meals together, learn together, play games together, sing together, joke together, give gifts to one another, tell a good story, listen to a good story, make music, explore together, teach, learn together, build, create together, rest together, pray together, worship God together. Make, like I said, a husband and wife to enjoy life together, to get to know each other, care for one another, laugh together, giggle together, bask in marital bliss, enjoy a loving kiss, or a sweet embrace. All of these and ex- the things, the experience, the people given by God to the made in, Im- in his image creatures whom he gave the capacity to enjoy these gifts. All of these are gifts from God in the setting before Genesis 3. In his loving wisdom, God put some limitations on enjoyment. God created all these things, and he knows and has the right to establish the best way for them to be enjoyed. And he declared some ways in which they shouldn't be enjoyed. Setting of Genesis 3, enjoy your own wife uh, with whom God made you to be one flesh. At this point, there was only one couple, but we still have limitations on our marital joy. Don't enjoy others like you enjoy your spouse. He made his creation not to be worshipped and loved above himself, but he declared, and, and it was the way in which man related to God, he said, worship and love God the creator and not the created things. Even before the fall, these created things, they, they weren't to be kept for themselves. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Don't be selfish, but imitate God's self-giving love by making more people with whom you can Love by loving others as you love yourself. And then God gave the explicit command, you can eat from the fruit of all the trees in the garden, except for one. In the middle of the garden, there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God gave really good gifts, tons of things to enjoy and the capacity to enjoy them. And he put some limitations on those gifts, not to withhold joy, or fun or enjoyment, but actually to maximize them and use them for their intended purpose to point to him as the giver of the gift and that those who receive them should trust in God and that those limitations were good and right. And now we read in Genesis 3, 1, read with me. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which Yahweh God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat from it. You shall not touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. A lie, a temptation, the belief that God is holding back, that there's actual greater joy not being content in what God has given you, but maybe going outside of what God has given you and pursue things that God has held back. You see, the the problem wasn't in the gift. The problem wasn't even in the existence of a potential pleasure not to be received. The problem was as soon as a desire inside Eve rooted in a distrust of God and wanting to seek pleasure outside of the pleasures that God had provided. As soon as that pleasure or that desire took hold, it gave birth to sin. Sin led to death. There was a belief that God's 
provision was not sufficient, that God's provision was deficient, and his constraints restricted, not provided for more enjoyment or a better life. You see, there was not greater joy to be found in going outside of God's provision. But look what happened. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food, a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. See, a delight, desire, these capacities for joy that God created to glorify him. They pursued sin, which would ultimately corrupt our relationship with those joys. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Then they heard the sound of Yahweh walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the God for whom all of these gifts were supposed to actually result in more fellowship, more joy together, actually point us through the gift to the giver of the gift, the misuse of them made them hide. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God in the midst of the trees of the garden. Eve was lured and enticed, not by the fruit, but by her desire for something that she didn't have that now she wanted. God had given these good gifts and their constraints to be received by faith. And Eve stopped trusting God and got carried away by her own lusts and desires. And Adam followed where he should have been leading. And likewise, he sought to use God's gifts in a way that God forbade. And sin was born. Suffering too. And it led to death. And life became a lot less fun. Because from now on, humanity would be characterized by the inability to find satisfaction in God's gifts because we had separated God from his gifts and began to live as if pleasure was ultimate and could be found apart from God. You've probably heard echoes if you know the book of James. James 1.13. Turn there now. It gives commentary on what happened in the garden. And it gives commentary on what happens in us when we are lured and enticed by our own desires into sin. It shows that sin corrupts our relationship with fun, with these gifts that God gave us to be experienced for his own glory. We see what happened to Adam and Eve, and we see what happened to us when we sin. Sin has corrupted our relationship with God's gifts. James 1.13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And then lust or when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully matured, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift, or every good thing given, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. When God gives us things or withholds things from us, fun, or the absence of fun included. His purpose is not to induce us to sin, but rather to strengthen our faith, right? James 1, 3, and it, his goal is to strengthen our faith and to point us to him. But it's our desires that take God's good gifts and corrupt them. Right? Financial difficulty or the absence to buy the things that we might want to enjoy, that can tempt us. 
But God's intention in this difficulty is to test our faith in order to prove its genuineness and in order to prove, produce endurance and maturity in his people. That's how the book starts in 1, 2 through 4. God intends difficult things as a g- gift for our good, for the strengthening of our faith. But testing doesn't only come from financial difficulty. Actually, in many ways, having much is more of a trial than having little. That's actually the context. You know the the thing that we have, like you see it in locker rooms. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You put it on shirts. We we hopefully have that memorized. It is a sweet verse, Philippians 4.13. But Philippians 4.13 comes after Philippians 4.12, in which Paul said that he's learning to be content with being filled and going hungry, having an abundance and suffering of need, right? Content with little, content with with much. That's hard. That's actually impossible, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Sometimes having much can be a test of our faith that's harder to endure in than having little. In like Jeremiah Burroughs in the book of the month for last month that I commended to you, Contentment, Prosperity, and God's Glory. He says, if you can deliver yourselves from the deceits of prosperity, it will not be very difficult to resist the temptations of adversity. So if you're given money so that you can buy fun things to enjoy, recognize that money is a gift from God. And the fun things that it provides, likewise, a gift from God. That's what James 1.17 says in 1 Timothy 6.17. We spent time on last week. We'll go to again later today. It declares that one of the purposes of God's good gifts to the rich, or really anybody to whom he provides those things, is to supply us with good things for what purpose? remember what it said? It said, for us to enjoy. So let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. God's purpose in the trial is not to tempt you to evil or destroy your faith, whether he withholds the things you want or he provides them. And God's gift of Eve to Adam was as a helper. But Adam in 3.12 in Genesis 3.12, did exactly what we are tempted to do. Rather than take responsibility for his own sin, what did he do? He said, God, the woman who you gave me, gave to be with me, she gave to me from the tree and I ate. She turned around, she blamed the good gift that God gave him is actually causing what came from Adam's own heart. We're tempted to do the same. Fun and the things with which we have fun, they can be used by your corrupted heart, this side of the fall, to pull you away from God. And indeed, for those who have not been saved, that is the entirety of their relationship with the gifts that God gave them to point them to him. They don't know God, so they cannot relate to those gifts rightly. So instead of blaming God or thinking that the problem relies or lies in the things that your heart tempts you, declare to yourself, these gifts that you gave me, God, they didn't make me sin. My heart, its desires made me sin. These gifts that you gave me for your glory, I've twisted them. I've Um, I've corrupted my relationship with them by following sin. God did not tempt you. Indeed, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming coming from our Father, and we ought to relate to those things that way. Our pleasures were never meant to be ultimate. James 4, 3, just later in this book, right, when you ask Things, for things from God, and he doesn't provide them. Say, God, 
I want, and you fill in the blank, a good thing that you might be asking for. God, can I have more? Fill in the blank so that I can glorify you with my experience of them. If you ask for things in that way, and you mean it, and God has given you the self-control to relate to those things rightly, chances are he'll actually provide those things. He will not withhold any good thing from his children. But if you ask and you don't receive, what does James 4, 3 say is probably going on? It's because you ask with wrong motives that you can spend it on your pleasures. Your pleasures were never meant to be ultimate, but when we make them ultimate, we make our pleasures substitute for God. It's what Philippians 3.19 describes is what, when he says people relate to their desires, their God is their belly and their minds are set on earthly things. No, as we experience these earthly things, we are meant to have our minds set on God. We were made to live for God and to enjoy the things he gives us as we live a life with our mind set on God. But as soon as we start living for the stuff, as if the stuff and the ultimate enjoyment of them is ultimate, we have lost the capacity to actually enjoy it. That's what sin has done to fun in this world. Sin makes us lose the ability to truly have fun because it makes fun God to the people in this world. So the next point is living for fun robs us of the capacity to be satisfied in it. Right? Sin has corrupted our relationship with fun. It's not God's gifts that tempt us to sin, but it's our desires that do. And as we live for fun, following those desires, it robs us of the capacity to ultimately be satisfied in the things we enjoy. Turn to Ecclesiastes 5.10. Ecclesiastes 5.10. The world lives for under the sun pleasures. Right? That's what Solomon in this book describes things that are confined to this life, the life under the sun, things that ultimately will be destroyed, don't, don't last for eternity. The good things that God made, but which our sin-marred world um, has corrupted, the things that are, are waiting for their, their ultimate restoration, to the ways that, that we should interact with them, right? Genesis 1 through 2, and then the last two chapters of the book were finally restored all of us together uh, to, to interact with God's gifts, the things that have been made in a way that honors God. But in the middle here, this under the sun existence, the world and those who are not reconciled to God, they live for these things and they love these things. And because they live for them, because they love them, they do not have the capacity to truly enjoy them, to be satisfied in them. Ecclesiastes 5.10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves, the abundant, who loves abundance with its produce. This, too, is vanity. If we seek to find ultimate satisfaction in this world, in money and the things, experiences, pleasures, fun that money can buy, we'll never be satisfied, right? We were made to be satisfied in God alone. And if we live for the stuff that God gives us, we never will be satisfied in it. Instead, we'll always live for the next thing, wanting more and more and being robbed of the capacity to truly enjoy it. Because in our sinfulness, we will have disconnected it from God. That's the point of the book, that we fear God and that we enjoy his gifts, his, his, all the experiences in this life in light of our fear of God. And in the gospel, through our, our newfound relationship to God, 
our restored relationships to God. Ecclesiastes 6, 1 through 7. If you jump down, we're going to skip part of the, the sweet part. We'll back up just a second to catch the end of 5. But I want to jump down to a, a, a longer commentary on that those who love money will not be satisfied with money. Ecclesiastes 6, 1 through 7 shows that those who live for this life and those who seek the things of this world as ultimate will not ultimately have the ability to even enjoy the things that they're given. There is an evil, it says, which I have seen under the sun and is prevalent among men. A man to whom God gives riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not empower him to eat from them for a foreigner eats from them. This is vanity and a sickening evil. If a man becomes the father of 100 children and lives many years, however many the days of his years may be, but his soul is not satisfied with the good things and he does not even have a proper burial, then I say better is a miscarriage than he. For that one comes in vanity and goes into darkness and that one's name is covered in darkness. Indeed, that one never sees the sun and never knows anything. That one has more rest than he. Even if the other man lives 1,000 years twice and does not see good things, do not all go to the same place? All a man's labor is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not fulfilled. Do you see what he's saying? If ultimately you are living for things that will all pass away, that cannot satisfy in and of themselves. Even if you experience them and you have a long life and you die, how is that any better than one who did not live? It's a tragedy. God, these people say, I just want riches. I want pleasures. And God gives them to them. They, they live life. They come, they go. They build them up. And they give them to the next generation that squanders it. At the end, if you are living life for that, for this accumulation of under-the-sun pleasures, even if God gives them to you, you'll find yourself not satisfied. And then if you're living for them and you don't get them, you're going to be running a rat race that will never ultimately come to completion. Because at the end of this under-the-sun life, we're all going to die. And if you're living for those things... What good is it? All the toil of man is for his mouth, and yet his appetite is not satisfied. He needs to eat another meal the next morning. This is why often the most rich in this world are most miserable, because he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. It's really hard to be rich and not find your heart pulled away in love after those things. It's really hard to have every experience that your heart desires. If you just want to go on vacation, you go. You want to go to a sporting event, you want to go to the Super Bowl and get front row seats, you have the, the ability to do it. If you get Super Bowl tickets and you want to go, enjoy it. You can enjoy it as a gift from God. But when you live for those things and say, I, I just want to labor for the next big hit, the next dopamine rush. If you love money, you'll never be satisfied. And he who loves wealth will never be satisfied with his income. This is why Jesus said, after looking at the sad example of the rich young ruler, he said, how difficult will it be for those who have wealth Right? For those who have everything, uh, enough money to provide instantly to meet every desire of their heart as soon as they want it, every pleasure that their heart wants, they can get. How difficult it is for them to enter the kingdom of God. This is because our flesh and its desires twist wealth and they seek to find ultimate satisfaction in that which can never satisfy and our gracious God often withholds pleasures from us in order to teach us that the pleasures do not, that our satisfaction and joy do not 
exist in those pleasures, but exist in God. It's interesting as you survey the Bible, I don't know any example in Scripture where God has wooed someone to himself through the provision of stuff, through the provision of fun, where somebody who wasn't already related to God in faith, God gave them stuff, and they said, oh, thank you, God, I'm going to follow you now. But it's very common for God to withhold those gifts, to actually put them through a trial of deprivation of those good things, so that then that person can follow them. And then and only then, now that they've been rightly related to God, can they then enjoy good gifts, the experiences of life, in a way that will honor God. Right? The, yet, the rich young ruler was offered eternal life with God at whose right hand is pleasures forevermore. And he went away sad. Right? This was a, this was a, a crazy lopsided trade. All right, just sell all your possessions, all the stuff that will only last as, as long as you live under the sun. Just sell all those things. Give it to the poor, and you'll have eternal life. Hey, God, the, the God who provided you all this stuff, don't worry, if he can give you that stuff now in this sin-cursed world, imagine what you're going to have in eternity where he promises that his right hand are pleasures forevermore. He's going to restore creation. He is going to make all things new. And this short, significant blip, if we were to just say, okay, I, I'm willing to part with all this stuff because my ultimate treasure isn't in that stuff. God says, okay, I'll, I'll give you the kingdom. I'm going to give you eternal life with me. I'm going to give you myself. That is a lopsided trade. But the rich young ruler went, as, went away sad because the, Jesus had revealed that he actually worshipped stuff. He worshipped money and the fun that money could buy and not God. And how tragic is that? His appetite would never be satisfied. If you love money, if you love wealth, you'll never be satisfied in your money, in your wealth. So how tragic is it that those non-satisfying good things made him walk away from the only one who can truly satisfy, from the one who realigns our relationship with stuff, with fun. That same stupid trade. There's no, there's no, that, that word stupid, it, it, it aims low. I'm sorry, I said the S word, but I'm, I'm not supposed to say that. Uh, it, it is just idiotic. It is an unfathomable, unfathomable trade to say, God, I am going to give up where I know true satisfaction and joy can be found and that you will actually use even the good gifts in life to point to you and, and that I'll find joy in those things now to say, no, I, I'm going to go after pleasures and joy my own way. I'm going to cheat on a test. I'm going to steal. I'm going to lie. I'm going to hold on to these things and worship them. I'm going to make my belly my God instead of you. And so instead of Ecclesiastes 5.10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. If you look at the gift that God gives to some, and we know that this gift only comes to those truly who fear God, you can have later in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 18, for some, namely those who fear God, God gives the ability to enjoy even this life if you don't live for it as ultimate. Here's what I've seen to be good which is beautiful, to eat, to drink, to see good in all one's labor for which he labors under the sun during the few days of his life, which God has given him, for this is his portion. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them 
and to take up his portion and be glad in his labor. This is a gift from God. See, even people who aren't rightly related, they get glimpses of this gift that's supposed to point you past these things to God. They still enjoy it, but they're not satisfied in it. They go for the next hit. For the... As we enjoy it, you won't remember much the days of his life because God allows him to occupy himself with gladness, with the gladness of his heart. That gladness is supposed to point us to an eternal gladness. Those experiences of joy are supposed to push us past the experiences in the gifts, in the fun, to the one who provided those things. Similarly, in 1 Timothy 6, The Bible hammers this over and over again. We're not going to cover everything, but this is the final important one in um, in this point. 1 Timothy 6. We're warned many times in the New Testament against the vain love of money. And, And I take love of money as a shorthand for the love of the fun that money can buy. Turn to 1 Timothy 6, 9. Warning about the rich and the temptation to fall or to to put our ultimate hope in, in the riches and the fun that it can buy. Timothy writes, he's not even saying to the rich. He's, you don't have to be rich to fall into this temptation. You might just want to be rich and you can fall into this temptation. First Timothy six, verse nine, he says, but to those who want to get rich, But those who want to get rich, they fall into temptation and a snare, right? It's not the riches that are the temptation or the snare, but it's it's the want to. It's the desires in the heart. And many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by aspiring to it, have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many grief. So the solution is not to avoid the stuff, not to avoid the money and the, and the, the stuff that money can buy. That's, if you just go back a page to 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, remember that's what the ascetics teach. It's the, something that has the, the look of godliness but isn't true godliness. The don't eat, don't taste, don't touch, don't get married kind of doctrine. Right? The, the problem isn't the things. It's the misplaced love of the things that pushes out love for God. Instead, godliness with contentment in what you have and contentment with what you don't have, that's the solution. Godliness with contentment. Right? Sin separates God from the desires. Sin separates contentment from the desires. It says, I want pleasure apart from God, and I want pleasure that God hasn't given. So what's the solution? Godliness with contentment is the solution so that you receive the gifts rightly. So immediately preceding that warning that we just read in 6, 9 through 10, just look back up a, a couple verses to 6, 6 through 8. Godliness actually is a means of great gain. You might think, oh, if I love the stuff and I pursue the stuff, I'm going to gain. And like, no, that's a way to lose your soul, lose everything. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we have brought nothing into the world so we can take nothing out of it either. And if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. Isn't it crazy that those who only have food and a house over their head but are rightly related to God will actually find more joy in that food and the simple house? They will find more fun in just the simple provisions that God's given than the richest of the rich that live for this world and live for that stuff as if it's ultimate. Right? Solomon tried that what the book of Ecclesiastes is. He's like, I had everything. And he lived for everything as if he could find joy in this under the sun life. He rejected God. And I think Ecclesiastes is his confession of repentance. 
at the end of his life, put in those things. We're, we're ultimately claiming, confessing that joy is not to be found in those things. And so you, you see in 1 Timothy 6.17 something that, that sounds a little bit like Solomon's warning in Ecclesiastes 5.10 about you won't find satisfaction in your money if you love it. Paul in 1 Timothy 6.17 says, command those who are rich in this present age. Right, because all believers are going to be rich in the age to come. And, and some in this present age, God gives stuff and some he withholds it. But those who are rich, they're at particular danger here. Uh, to wander away from the, the faith, pierce themselves with many griefs, right? Command those who are rich not to be haughty or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but set your hope on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy, right? That verse right there, I'd say is our key verse for the theology of fun, fun tries to pull you away and it tries to make you set your hope on the uncertainty of riches or on the uncertainty of fun that riches promise that will pass away, that might not be there tomorrow, and that were ultimately given to you by God to enjoy. So enjoy them when you have them. Be content when you don't. Paul says, he goes on, command those rich to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, right? Don't keep all the good stuff that God gave you only to yourself, but imitate your heavenly father who gave them to you by giving to others in love so that they uh, make that they may be ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. You see, the, the things in this world promise, hey, in me, in these things, this is life. You know, you've, that's the saying, oh, this is the life. Have you ever said that? Like you're on vacation, you're on a cruise ship, you lay back, you have a drink in your hand, the, the sun shining down on you not a care in this world. You don't have to go to work. And you say, this is the life. It's, it's not the life. That is not the life. Eternal life, the life is found in God and God alone. And if you seek to find your pleasure in this life, it will actually pull you away. It might actually, at the final judgment, Cause Jesus to send you away in judgment to eternal death. Ultimately, living for pleasures and the stuff in this world, that will fail you when you need it most. Luke 12, 16 through 21. Jesus told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Right? I have a lot of stuff. I need, I need to keep it really close. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns, build larger ones, and there I will store my grains and my goods. He presumed upon tomorrow. He was enjoying his stuff without thought of God. And what did he say? He said to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But he didn't know that God was about to end his life. And God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you prepared? He was in that vain cycle of life that Ecclesiastes talks about. You're going to get rich. And the ones who didn't work for it are going to get it. That's vanity. It's a bummer. It's the way that this world is. And this fool was living as if these things in life were a thing worth living for. And he says, so is the one, a fool, who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You see, sin exchanges the glory of the creator and ultimate satisfaction in the creator with the created. That's the foundational definition of sin. 
The most foundational meaning of sin is to exchange the glory of the immortal God for substitutes, to value something as more, to, as more valuable, more worthwhile than God himself. We're going to end in Romans chapter 1. You see that since the creation of the world, Romans 1.20, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been seen. When you look at the Grand Canyon, you ought not say, oh, that canyon is great, but you say God is great. When you look up at the stars in this universe that God holds in the span of his hand, you shouldn't say, oh man, this universe is huge. It, it is, but he gives testimony to the God who is huger. You don't look at the, the nuclear power, that, that fusion that powers the sun and glory in the atom. You glory in the God who made the atom and all that power within it that creates the sun and its light and the heat that lets us enjoy this world. And this world is without excuse because every single person can see God did that. But verse 22, professing to be wise, all of humanity became fools. And we exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the likeness of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. We worshiped the things that God made and wanted the things that God made and put glory in the things that God made instead of the one whose glory those things were supposed to point us to. And what did God do? He judged us. He didn't merely judge us for doing that, but actually as we do that more and more and more, we see that that is God's judgment poured out on humanity. Verse 24, God gave them over in the lusts of their flesh to impurities so that their bodies would be dishonored. Right? They're like, God, I don't want to honor you. This is what humanity says. God, I don't want to honor you. And God says, fine, I'm going to let you get what you ask for. And you see humanity more and more and more and more disconnecting from the ways that God said true pleasures to be found. God created man and woman, put them together and say, you know, there's actually great joy, great fun to be had when one woman is married to one man, committed and selfless, self-giving love for life. And as the world who, did, who doesn't honor God walks in that pattern, they, they tend to experience more of the, well, not ultimately, but, but more of the image of the joy that God put there, of the fun that God put there. God says, no, all right, if you're going to reject me, I'm going I'm to let you get what you want. And God gave them over to impurity. He gave them over, verse 26, to their dishonorable passions. And because they didn't acknowledge God, verse 28, he gave them over to do things that aren't proper. And if you look at that list in 29, 30, 31, 32, all of those things, whether it's unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, murder, envy, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanders, haters of God, violent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, all these things, what are they ultimately doing? It's somebody saying, I want more for myself. I want more fun. I want more pleasures. I want more experience. And I refuse to find those things in God. That's exactly what happened in the garden. That's where that path started. Sin is an exchanging of satisfaction and joy in the Creator with the never-to-be-fulfilled pursuit of satisfaction and joy in creation. It's exchanging God for the stuff that he made. The ultimate stupidity that we would know something of God through what he made and then reject him and trade him away. The God-rejecting exchange is at the heart of all of our misuses of fun. Even as a Christian, when we misuse fun, we're walking back in the way that we used to be. 
when we're willing to sin to get more fun. The problem isn't in the fun. It's not in the gift or the, the thing that we're pursuing. It's that we're actually pursuing it apart from God as if it's ultimate, thinking that if I step outside of the limitations that God put on it or pursue fun that God hasn't provided for me, I'm going to have more fun. And the result is less. The result is no satisfaction. And the ultimate effect of that kind of pursuit is death. God's will for us is so much better. And through the gospel, he sets us free from our slavery to those lusts and passions. And for the first time when we're saved... We can love God. We can know God. And the result is that we no longer live lives in the passion of lusts and desires like those who don't know God. I have in mind Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. First Thessalonians 4, 3. Turn there and we're going to end. For this is the will of God. Your holiness. Your holiness is the will of God. And he accomplished that holiness by taking your sin and putting it on Christ and imputing Christ's righteousness to you and then changing you from the heart so that you can live a holy life. His will for you is that you would know how to control your own body in holiness and honor there's actually more joy and more fun to be had when you relate to God's gifts and holiness and honor, right? When you say no to the extra slice of pie or the extra marital affair or no to putting pleasure or to to holding up pleasure in the place of God as ultimate and ultimately satisfying, to being able to control your own body, not in the passion of lust or the passion of desire, like those who don't know God, right? Not knowing God means that you will live for your passions and your lust. When God saved you, Christian, he made you to know him, to know him rightly. And now you relate to all of these things that you can enjoy, that he made for you to enjoy, and he gave you a body to enjoy them. You can now relate to them knowing God. And their use is sanctified. It's to made, made holy, right? First, uh, First Timothy 4.4, 4, your use of these things is sanctified, made holy, just like you, through relating to them in that knowledge of God. And that's what we are going to go to next time in part three, that Christians are the only ones who can truly have fun in this world because we're the only ones who truly know God. Let's pray. God, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for not leaving us in our rebellion to you, living for this world as if it's ultimate, only to have it all taken away at the end. And then we're face to face with you as judge. And then we're cast away into hell where there is no more enjoyment. No more stuff, no more pleasure, zero fun, and there is only wrath. God, I I pray that you would use this message and these reminders of what sin is and the way that sin has tainted, corrupted our relationship to fun to make us use your gifts and the fun in those gifts to point us to you as ultimate, that our joy and our satisfaction, whether we have fun or you've withheld it from us in this life, that our satisfaction, our joy, and our love would be in you and for you alone. In Jesus' name, amen.